of uh sorry <laughs> it's a fun of seeing um seeing other people's work and showing your work immediately to others drawing a whole figure mm-hmm. it's a totally different experience um yeah that'd be interesting to, to see because yeah. you've been um you've been just drawing portraits the, the last few I, I feel like i say this every about six months or so but i'm like damn took another leap in those last few i didn't comment on them or anything but you know they were fucking awesome <clears throat> there's just something about the color and the depth and like the it's like obviously so sur- like super surreal and not not really realistic but um but it looked real you know what i mean it's kind of like uh us yeah. kind of like some of the stories we've been talking about actually it's like real but it's it's like surreal you know maybe i could show you them right you now see the person can... you know here let me do this are you watching a thing hmm, how do yeah, i flip I this you. here we go uh, this is the one I was just working on. It looks so much better in real life. You see this stuff on on video. It's, it doesn't look very it, fro- it froze. I see it, but it's like frozen. There you go. Now that looks good. I could <laughs> kind of see it. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, new, uh, so. Got them old ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you started off. I remember now, like, when you first started drawing again, seriously, you kind of had this, like, black and white thing going and you quickly went to pastels i guess the black and white is just charcoal but you're always like a uh, pastel person i mean even in uh, azel's yeah. class you had the same kind of like style i guess not style but like um inclination towards this certain colors of the pastel yes and just the pastels in general. Everything's done super fast. Everything, yeah. you know, you don't have to wait for things to dry. You don't have to wait. Um, like, nothing's planned. It almost feels more like writing in that yeah. respect. When you're, when you're really writing, you're not. Mm-hmm. You're just throwing things in the paper. and Yeah, it's like. You know, um, the work works. You get caught up in it, you know, hopefully, if it's good. <laughs> Sometimes, I mean, I've been drawing too a little bit. I've stopped, for, you know, I've taken a break, you know, because I took it, I started taking it too seriously and I'm like, not drawing, not drawing. <laughs> so I took a fucking break from it because I was getting mad at myself about it. I'm a little fucked up in the head when it comes to art, I guess. But, um, when I, yeah, so like, so that was my problem. I was having trouble getting in, into that rhythm, but there, it is similar. It is pretty similar to like when you're in the, um, in the zone, I guess, with writing. Um, I think I think you're somebody. So... Sorry, you're somebody who has to draw from something in front of them. Yeah, you know, and so so much of what you you're like your muse obviously was Laura, but yeah, uh, yeah, you can only draw. You only draw Laura over. so many times. You know? <laughs> like you probably drawn her two hundred times by now, <laughs> like without without probably. hyperbole. Probably. I don't know about that many, but yeah, there's I'm looking back at the wall here and I'm uh I have a I had a I had to take a bunch down, but I had a bunch on the wall that's behind me. Um trying to think which ones are from pictures. So I did have a really good like you could still really get into it with a picture, um, like it with like you're drawing a model, but those ones usually come out more um I'm more like a slave to the details, you know, like I want to uh, yeah. get the, a lot of the, sh- a lot of the little minute details. And of course you can, because it's a, obviously a picture like that. When I drew a view uh, at Chris's house, I, I, I was like, fuck it. I'm drawing the goddamn bricks on the wall and the bottles on the table, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so it can be, it could be fun, but like the fun part about drawing, um, when you're not like thinking like that and in a lot of cases when i'm drawing laura since it, she's like hurry the fuck up not really but um <laughs> i'm like i gotta just go <laughs> you know i just you just gotta go yeah. um well that's how you get to the subconscious is when you stop thinking about what you're doing and you're just you're just yeah. there you're just there wherever wherever your subconscious is so it is kind that's of similar you- to like poetry I mean, it's. I mean, I, you could talk more on fiction than me, but um, that's definitely how it feels, especially, especially like a really good like first draft. Um, when it just feel like I don't know, there's something. It has a similar. There's definitely a similar f- 
feeling you get from it, even though it's a different uh, mechanism, ma- uh, ma- material. There's like no material for writing, but you know what I mean? It's like, uh, do you know, do you know the this, old metaphor they used to use when you used to talk about writing a poem you used to say it was like, uh, somebody kicked you out of the airplane with a book bag full of like miscellaneous stuff. And you have to build a parachute before you hit the ground. <laughs> That's what I used to say. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> Someday you need to write a poem about that. Yeah. <laughs> about that I'm glad you have a memory on you. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure I heard that at the um, Palm Beach Poetry Festival. I forget who said it, though. And I probably just, you know, co-opted it. But um, Or I could have made it up. I don't know. I've made up a lot of shit back then. Well, it's a lot like teaching, too. What I used to tell my students when I asked, what's teaching like? I'm like, it's like being kicked out of an airplane, you know, with a book bag yeah. full of stuff. Yeah, and hopefully you have a you've put up enough stuff in your bag <laughs> to to land yeah. safe. Otherwise, I mean, I'm sure you've had days like this where you're like just fucking free falling and you're either gonna, you know, somehow like stick the landing or not. <laughs> and that's what the whole some first semester felt like. It felt like especially the first class, just yeah. like Falling out of an airplane, hitting the ground. Falling out of an airplane, hitting the ground. And yep. slowly developing wings from that. Slowly developing uh, the tools I needed to to like effectively teach a class. Um, mm-hmm. The second class always went better because by then, yeah, you had I knew the, the blueprint. I knew what I was what I was supposed to be. I like I realized finally what I was trying to do. You mean like um, teaching back to back classes of the same thing, right? Yeah. The second yeah. class always went better. Um but there are some classes like last semester, my first class, they just had nothing. They had nothing. They it was like talking to myself the whole time. Fucking that that was like yeah. that was um, my Zoom classes were, man. Like I always <laughs> got lucky with my classes, always had like one or two. And that's a thing, by the way. Like yeah, a lot of teachers just hope and pray they have like one or two. You know, and sometimes if you get nothing, it's it's it could be scary. <laughs> then you're in it for a whole semester, you know. Did I show you what they wrote? Because <laughs> I only got spots from them. <laughs> there was this one girl in the class named Michelle who was 15, um, and was sitting in the front of the class and was yeah. just brilliant, just fucking brilliant, dude. Was talking circles and arguing circles around everyone in that fucking class. Yeah, putting them to shame. And so I would just talk to her the whole class. <laughs> really. Um, Love it. <laughs> you know, and, and eventually I'd be like, when I start asking the class questions, I wouldn't let her answer. Cause I was like, guys, you cannot let Michelle carry this class for you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and, and so I would shame them even when I didn't let her answer. Um, so they wrote their spots and they're like, yeah, it seemed like he was just teaching to one student the whole semester. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> I'm like, well, what are you going to do? You know, like <laughs> she's the only one engaged in the class and the material. So naturally the material, you know, engages with her. Well, that's the, okay. that's just for the um, people who review that, you know, like they're going to, whoever is reviewing that's probably a teacher too. So they, they, they know what that is all about. They know what that's like. So I want to worry about that too much. No, I'm not. It's just funny. It's the real, the real people. one, the real cutting ones are on a uh, rate my professor because there ain't shit you can do about that. It's public. <laughs> I haven't even looked at mine in a while. I need to check it out. Probably Last time I looked at yours, there. they were fucking awesome. <clears throat> well, we'll see how they are after <laughs> the last semester. Last. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I also basically, teaching. I basically like the lot. La- I don't know. It's, it's something else to get into at some other point, but I had this student plagiarize his last essay writing about, of all the things, how we need to terraform Mars. I'm like, dude, why the fuck are you arguing about Mars? You're fucking 20 years old. You don't know jack shit about terraforming anything. You know? <laughs> like, oh, naturally, you're going you're gonna to plagiarize because there's nothing else you can do because you don't you have no experience and the material. Right. Like, what, tough, what, what have I been talking tough, about this whole semester? Uh, what, what was the prompt for that? Like, why did he choose that? Could it be anything? I, I wrote I wrote that they could 
um, write about whatever they wanted. But I was teaching four classes, so I didn't get a chance to review everyone's thesis proposal before they started on them. Oh, that's key. And yeah. this guy did not meet. Um, he did not meet during the uh, student teacher conferences that I had scheduled, so I didn't even get to look at his. It wouldn't have mattered if I had looked at it or not, because he wouldn't have. You know, he still would have done it because um, he didn't come meet with, during the conferences. So he doesn't find out until afterwards, like after I look at the thing, which, by the way, it comes back like it's an obvious plagiarism case. You right, know, he's he plagiarized and, way, and even when he came in, he's like, I didn't plagiarize anything. I tried to reword everything that I was, you know, that I found off the Internet. I'm like, well, that's that's still plagiarizing. <laughs> what you just said is the definition of plagiarism. So, so he didn't even know what the fuck he was doing. Yeah. Until you he, had to he was tell just him. A jackass. Um, yeah, it was more like a plagiarism by stupidity than it was plagiarism by maliciousness. But um, he wasn't too happy with me after I, I did shit like that uh, once or twice, like early on comp one, I think. Um, not to like out myself or anything, but yeah, I'm pretty sure I uh, reworded some <laughs> shit because I didn't understand um what like. I didn't understand like you that taking from the 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 way it was taught to me is that you just you can um, read a source and use that source and uh, paraphrase it or whatever. Um, But I didn't realize what paraphrasing what paraphrasing means saying the thing in your own words while also giving credit to the to the actual source. So I I basically did the same thing where I was like just changing words out and trying to you know yeah. So I think we're all stupid. It that was stuff point. done out of ignorance more than maliciousness. If it was, uh, you know, that's the thing. Your, your teacher probably figured the same thing. This kid's probably, this kid's not doing something malicious. He's just doing something out of ignorance. And let me just teach him the right way to do this. With that kid, it, it really wasn't that he was trying to plagiarize. He was just too stupid to write about something that he knew about. Um, yes. Exactly. Well, that that, that was yeah, definitely part of the problem, and I think that's a part of that's a big problem with a, a lot of um like newer writers and students and shit. They just they feel like there's some standard they have to live up to in college. Um, by and well, I mean at least this is the case for me. Like, especially in grad school, like I felt like I had to write a paper like an MA student. It never occurred. To, well, it didn't occur to me till very very late that I could write a paper like a poet and my and if i just talked to my professors they would appreciate it um and in this case it's more about writing about shit you know you know you have a baseline of knowledge with so that when you go and like do the research you're not starting from zero um so it's yeah i think i think a lot of the students are just like oh i gotta write a a, a smart paper about a, a smart subject you know yeah, and terraforming is, Mars is like, what's the research on that? You know, I guess right. it's out there. I don't know. Man. It's probably some no, I'm weird sure there is, about it. I'm sure there's, there's articles, but you haven't like built any of the machinery. You haven't studied any machinery. You haven't studied any of the theory, you know, so why would anybody 20 years old be writing about those things? Unless you're the son or daughter of a NASA physicist or something, you know, and your parents are coming home and talking and explaining about this stuff, you know, for fun. Um, why bother? I don't know. Right. Like to me that, so I was trying to explain it to him. Like that's an interest that you have. That's cool. That you're interested in these things. Clearly he was. Yeah. But, um, but it's not some, it's not your life, you know? Um, it's not something that you've done with your hands. You wrote this essay earlier that semester about hunting uh, elk. Um, right, you're going to get a better essay out of something like yeah, that. Yeah, I'm like, dude, because you've done it, because you've lived it. You know, I had this other student who wrote about, um, was eight years old when, her, when she shot her first deer, and she cried, and her father was right there with her, and he was so happy <laughs> Yeah. that... Uh, <laughs> And she done. I'm like, man, this is so cool. This is so much better than most of the stuff that most of you guys are writing because it's about something you've lived and breathed. And 
Yeah, there's segue into the segue into the topic of the day. I mean, you know, which is always our topic, which is you know the the fine the fine line between fiction and nonfiction that these guys and gals operate on. Um, this, I mean, for, for all we know, this is just just a story that Sharon Olds read in the newspaper that day. We don't know necessarily. I mean, I don't know necessarily if. Um, she actually saw this, so she was actually on the ground the day that this guy uh, was. Yeah, I don't know about history either about this. Like, what? What is, what is this? Is it? Um, for some reason, I have this. Um, just thinking about it now, I have this memory of uh, that she was like on a ride along or something, but I'm not sure where I heard that or read that. Um, Maybe it's just a, a theory that that we had back in the day when we first, you know, kind of talked about this poem. But it kind of seems like it's it seems it does blur the line because the she's not really the speaker's not really a, a big part of the the scene, oh, the even though yeah. even though they're there, like they're in the scene. They're not physically in the scene, but they're watching it as if they were there in the scene. Um, yeah, the poem. Um, and in that sense, it's actually really different than a lot of poems. You know, it's surprising in, in that respect that the the subject matter is not the speaker, and the speaker really isn't a character in mm -hmm. the events that are being talked about. Um, we don't really even get to know any of the characters per se. Um, none right. of them have names. We just have this event as it unfolds. It's, it reminds me a lot of Dog Day Afternoon, the movie, because it's so much about the, um, it's so much about the event, and so much about the world. Um, I mean, she calls it the machinery of the world coming to life, you know, to save this guy's life. Uh, and so much about being a spectator in this. Uh, which the reader is also the reader is also a spectator watching these things yeah as they're unfolding um it is um well i th so you know in the it's in the in a it approaches like almost a pure like narrative poem and my understanding of narrative uh, might be different than yours a little bit i think it is actually but um basically narrative poem a narrative <laughs> means you have a narrator that doesn't really talk much it is report um and that's kind of what's happening here although there is a little bit of reflection uh right before the end of the poem uh which kind of like you know comes out of nowhere we could talk about that a little bit um but yeah i think i would like to before we like get into like the nitty gritty and shit of this poem um <laughs> can can you just like What's a, this is like one of the first Sharon Olds poems I ever, ever really just like fell in love with um, because it was this this book that it's out of the gold cell uh, was the first book of hers I ever got uh, at the request of Winston, our old teacher, yeah. our old lit teacher. Yeah. Um, he's like, I think we were doing those workshops after his class, the one that the class that Angie and I were in, and then you were coming afterwards, I think sometimes to meet up for the workshop or every time to meet up for the workshop. Um, and I think after the first workshop, he's like, John, man, you got to get shit this book. Sharon, he's I'm doing a horrible fucking accent. Yeah. You got to get this book. You got you to gotta, uh, get some Sharon Olds. And I'm like, all right. And I, I was like, and he's like, gold, get the gold cell. And I got the gold cell and I got some other book. I, I forget who it was. He suggested a couple people, but he was like, Sharon Olds is your shit. And, yeah. um, and of course, this is the first poem in the book. So as soon as I open the book, this is the poem. You know, this is the first Sharon Olds poem I read. And it blew my fucking mind as a yeah. um, 22, 23-year-old community college loser uh, turned, like, <laughs> poet. Um <laughs> As I think a lot of po maybe a lot of poets like there's out there I don't know maybe um, but yeah I, I didn't realize what poetry was all I knew about poetry really was 
um, hip hop. Well, really? yeah, hip hop, and uh, but from my own, like from an in- internal perspective, was my um, writing, my own writing, and how I wrote poetry, which is yeah. completely like <laughs> it was influenced by hip hop or you know whatever I had heard up until that point about writing, probably through Laraka. Um, yeah, Laraka used to say you were like a chef, never ate food. <laughs> <laughs> right, because he asked me like, "Who are your favorite poets?" Which is a very basic question, and I'm just like, "Uh." <laughs> and of right. course, Laraka has such such, such a, a way with words. He is completely he he was great at eviscerating you and building you up in the same fucking sentence. Um, yeah. and um, you should have yeah, told so, him Biggie Smalls and Oz. Yeah, okay. that would have that would have that answer would have blew his mind if I had the the wherewithal to say something like that. <laughs> he probably would have been Andre like, "Yeah, those are fucking poets." <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's it, basically. That and uh, obviously the hoity-toity notion of what a po- poet was—you know, Shakespeare. Yeah, he probably read some E. Cummings a little bit. Some yeah, maybe. My hands are and some Shakespeare. You know. I don't even know how much of that I had given my like shit education um, up until college. But yeah. So anyway, my, to my point, opening this book. The first lines of the first poem are just somebody talking to you. It's not like it's not a it's not even a it's not even up to the to the um the high the hoity toity what's a better word the um the standards of like highfalutin um like lyricist uh hip hop that we we just talked about like those are really complicated uh syntax and rhyme schemes and and shit. It wasn't even that. It was just somebody talking to you. Yeah, it's almost like a newspaper. It's almost like a journalist from a newspaper just right. giving you the past, you know. And it was it was just so accessible and I was <laughs> like, that's what I want to write. That's what kind of poet I want to be like. And so You would always give that poem and Carolyn Forche's The Colonel. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, as which like, is, like Which is good just example like a, for Sorry. Yeah, I mean that's just this that's I mean the the Colonel is almost feels like a journal entry. You know, it's just a list of things that happened that day and list of things that she saw, which really all this is all this poem is. So it's just, yeah, it's, and that's the magic of it is that it reaches such uh, a high flutin, <laughs> high flutin like uh, meaning or like m- it moves you in such like a, a deep way, or at least I really did back then, uh, especially the first time I the first, you know. Become as I was well, becoming who I who I eventually became, well, you know, as a writer or whatever, growing through the stages, like that moved the fuck out of me, and it it seemed magical, and because there was no like tricks really, well, there are though. I looked at it, and I broke it down a little bit today. There are uh, some tricks in here, but it's it's mostly like you said. Probably, I mean, we're talking a lot about hip hop, you know, oddly enough, but it. it makes sense because those guys created a i mean we're talking about all the complicated syntax and everything but they're still talking the way that they would naturally talk you know right Biggie smalls and tupac um and andre 3000 it almost feels like you're just sitting in a car next to them while they're talking about their lives in the yeah, midst like- of eminem's chem you know as complicated a, a, a story as that is just it it feels like you're just a, a fly on the wall as this thing is, you know, um, as this thing is unfolding. And the reason that that magic happens is because they're not trying to be highfalutin. They're just trying to get what happened in their life as directly to you, the viewer, as they can. And the magic and the art of it is that they've listened to hip hop. They've, li- they've read poems, whatever, their whole lives. And so the filtering of their mind to yours naturally and seamlessly comes out in this poetic way. Um, right. And yeah. the case of Sharon Olds and Carolyn Forche, um, Yusuf Kawanyaka. That's the other there. one I was thinking of, Newton Interrogation. Yep. If we're going to group these yep. poems together, the early ones. Um, that all kind of had that same, um, that, that kind of gave us the same idea of what a poem should be. Um, Hell yeah. That's what I, dude, that's what, when I read this, the first thing I wrote down on the paper was, 
the the prototypical poem like this to me is a prototypical poem um it's a little bit more extreme in the narrative sense like i i usually if i'm doing i'm gonna put more reflection in it or whatever um just naturally um and i think sharon olds usually does too if you if we look at some of her other poems you know even in this book um i go back to may 1937 is it's more personal it's about her parents so it's you know you yeah she talks that was more the one the that eye. started the the movie um into the wild starts with that poem you know that's um, the first time i ever heard of sharon olds i just didn't know what the fuck they were talking about when i saw that movie <laughs> <laughs> um yeah yeah it's a great it's a well it's a it's a great read of the poem actually uh and you know what you realize when you hear that guy reading it is the point of these poems is that a lot of people relate to to what's going on i mean that poem's about uh childhood trauma and the horrible things that two people do to each other yeah. And about being a byproduct of two people who should not have ever been together getting together. <laughs> yeah. You know, and um, it, it, that's hard. It's the crux is I want to stop it, but I can't because, you know, ultimately I want to be a person and I want to be here right now. I want to exist. <laughs> yeah, I want to exist. <laughs> so it's like this very deep, like deep uh, seated uh, fear or desire or fear of like non existence, I guess. But uh, the impulse think, as a kid to want to like, the end, yeah. What she says apart. at the end is, is uh, go ahead and be together. Mm-hmm. You're gonna do terrible things, and I will tell people about them. <laughs> right. That's and, another uh, poem that, like, if you read that at, at a certain age, man, <laughs> as you're learning how to yeah. write a poem, it just gives you agency over your whole life, basically. Um, and that's what Sharon Olds really me- meant to me and me, it still means to me as a writer, like it's just freedom to write about whatever you want. Um, even if it's about, you know, people you love, um, and, and they're not in, like shown in, in great lights all the time. Um, but you know, you still love them um, and you still, um, you know, the best, try to find the best meaning story in it. about that. My favorite story of Laraca's is Cosmos, where he's talking about his dad hitting him. Yeah. For essentially no reason. Yeah, yeah. For essentially no reason except the kid is um, trying to get out of this uh, day out where they're enjoying this horse. You know, they're out riding with him, this really famous horse. And the kid is scared of the horse, and he falls down on his butt and commences to cry. And refuses to go near it. <laughs> and so his dad hits him for this. Um, it was really an act of abuse. If ever there was one. You know, I'm going to hit. And he says it's the hardest that he was ever hit. Uh, in his whole life. It was by his father that day. Um, in spite of all that, the story is also about love. You know, you love your family in spite of their flaws. Or because of them. Um... So, right, and think about I go back on on uh, my father speaks to me from the from dead. Jesus, yeah, it's also about you know my father was this ultimately really super flawed man and he's abusive. He's borderline just uh, evil. Possibly, I mean, I don't, I don't know how much you read of her first book, uh, Father. Was it Father? No, Satan says it was a first. Yeah, Father um, was a few down the line. It was after well, Gold Cell, actually. One of the poems in Father was her dad would, when they were living in San Francisco, drive really fast up the hills and so that when he was going down, the car would literally be airborne for a little bit. And she would get so scared that she would piss herself. <laughs> and her okay. dad knew that she would do this, but would do it anyways because uh, because it was funny to him. The kind of guy her dad was. Um, and really... It sounds a lot like my dad. <laughs> I got... 
Well, I got to find that poem and send it to you. Um, but really, probably, you know, I, uh, yeah, I need to re- re- reread it if I haven't read it. The, the beauty of this poem, coming back to summer, uh, summer solstice, um, the beauty of this is you think going um, forward in this poem, because there's a sense of dread that's almost built as these, uh, as the police officers and this guy are starting to confront each other, that something really terrible is going to happen. You know? Yeah, um, totally. And you can tell that that's what the the speaker and that's what the people on the ground are expecting to happen. It may even be what the police are expecting to happen. You know, they're they're getting on their bulletproof vests, they're putting now, these rope around their shoulders. Putting um, a, a just a pause on your point, uh, they uh, so the speaker that goes kind of back to the the way this is told and the narrative's thoughts on the uh, the scene that she's telling kind of lets us know what she thinks and what you're that's what you're getting at is basically she's expecting punishment like uh, like a like i said something terrible is going to happen he's going to jump he's going to get arrested whatever but she never says that it's just how it's written so that's that's kind of an interesting way to write a poem yeah in fact it's i mean it's one of her most effective poems um, the first line, by the way, was on the start of, or was it on the start or at the end of the longest day? the end day of the of longest the day, yeah. On the end of the longest day, you know, which kind of makes you feel like it's it's just too much life has been burdened on this man. You know, it's the longest day of the year and he can't take it anymore. Um, and you're, uh, and it's it's strange in that it almost feels like ants are moving by how far away people are and how meticulously um, described their actions are and how yeah. you can see everything, everything around them all at the same time. I actually have the poem. Um, right over here. Yeah. Um, it's, it's kind of, cr- it's kind of crazy. Uh, the, when I uh, was looking at this, like I decided to kind of break it down because there seemed to be like certain things she was doing throughout and like inter, woven within the poem and i don't i want to talk about this kind of in a a structure like in a a way that like kind of talks about structure and i don't want you to like think that i think that sharon olds is thinking like this as she's writing a poem i'm just like looking at it as you know and that's my right as an observer i can like break it down and whatever um but if you look at it 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 is all one big scene and there's certain things that are happening in it and the big thing that you noticed over and over and over and over again is how much action there is, how much movement. She's, people are doing things. You know, he's he's running up the stairs. He's um, on the he's he's on the ledge. The machinery of the the earth begin, and she describes the cops. All this all this stuff's happening around him. The the net is being splayed. The crowd is gathering. Um, the cops are approaching slowly, slowly. And then he steps down and there's all this like minute action um, that kind of goes along with what you're saying with like in minute detail. Um, not only that, of course, all the action is combined with like scene building shit, like setting, description, the characters who are described, like you said, at a distance, no names. Like, uh, you know, when she says the machinery of the earth, she gives this um, big abstraction but fills it in with all this detail. That's another thing she does that I noticed throughout the poem um, here and there. She has these big flourishes, abstractions grounded in scene. That's a big lesson you could take from this poem. If you're going to use abstraction, ground that shit in scene, ground it to a, a, a noun, something fucking uh, concrete. Like the huge, let's talk about that line. Then the huge machinery of the earth began to work for his life. That works. Why does that work? You, we already got the setup of the, um, the poem this guy's gonna kill himself the machinery of the earth you kind of have an idea what that is already but then she goes and explains that minute detail so that that abstract like weird flourish of a line gets sandwiched by all this concrete stuff so it makes complete sense um another one example of a flourish that i saw was while his his leg hung over the next world um squatting next to his death like these abstract kind of flourishes that she kind of just she's pushing it 
pushing it, you know, she's like pushing into a different uh, realm, you know, a little bit with her, no, kind of literally, I guess, depending on the subject matter. But she is like reaching for something in those lines um, that make the poem special. And those are those are things that kind of like stick with you. And and the last thing um, are the images and like the similes, really, uh, that she just throws in here and there that also like kind of like anchor the poem down into this like very memorable scene. Um, their suits, you know, the describing the cops. The first one I saw was uh, their suits were blue, gray as the sky in a cloudy evening, bulletproof vest, black shell around his life. Um, the cop coming out of the roof, like the gold hole that's on the top of the head. That was a fucking weird one. And she, I think she named her book after the um, hairy net, um, placeable grid, uh, spread out like the sheet to receive at a birth, et cetera. I can go, I mean, there's a few more and it ends on one as well. Um, so, man, it's just like, it's not just a scene. Because if it was just a scene, all she had to do was say, this guy's going up to, a, you know, to the building and this is what the building looks like. <laughs> Uh, but no, it's like there's all this energy. And I think that's what we mean when we talk about energy and writing is that like all this shit just like pops out, you know, the similes pop out of the scene. Um, yeah. And this is the, nat- the nature of writing when you are uh, disciplined enough to commit to it. If this is how you want to write a poem, by the way, um, you, you commit to that scene, you start building it and then boom. The blue gray, like the like the sky on a cloudy evening. Um, he, he's sitting next to his death. You know, his shirt's glowing like a, a petri dish. Uh, you know, like she, she didn't say that. It's it's better than that. But uh, <laughs> you know, shit just pops out of the scene um, like that, and eventually she gets to this point where, like the the to me, this is what blew my mind when I first read the poem all those years ago. Is that last scene? It's a resolute. It's yeah. it's the last scene. I should say that last uh, simile image, um, and the red glowing ends burned like teeny campfires. It was not just a cool image, but it exp- it like makes it super anti. You know, you said ants. It like goes way out. You know, away from the personal, and and makes and and delivers the feeling without saying what she was feeling. Uh, of the scene and it also does more than that it really it's it it goes towards a resolution you know there's a whole story arc happening in this poem um just through imagery and simile and you know uh because she allowed herself to get there through the scene and it's you know it's another one of those those writings that before i go too long i'll stop in a sec um it's another one of those works that kind of kind of reminds me of um the philip roth story we talked about and not just because you know it's about (laughs) this is about an actual suit like almost suicide but um not because of the similar uh imagery but because it's like it's almost it's leak proof you know it's just perfect It, it just came out uh in a very in a way that can't be taught uh not directly and, um, you know, you can't really, you can't change a thing about it. Uh, like if this went up to the workshop, into a workshop, I don't know. It just, <laughs> it defies all that. I don't know. It, it, it stands on its own. And, um, and that's why I preface everything I said about breaking down the different elements. Because, you know, I think while she may have learned how to write a simile, maybe, I think it just came, I think similes come naturally to Sharon Olds, kind of like Leo. Um, in a way that that obviously can't be taught, but it can be cultivated. Um, and I think the way she's cultivating it is learning the the boring parts of writing, you know, like establishing the scene, um, and and allowing for those things to come more naturally than they otherwise would. Because if you don't have the scene, you're forcing all the similes. If you don't have the scene, you don't get these cool lines like the machinery of the earth or the uh, leg hung over the cornice, like the like it like the over the lip of the next world you don't get lines like that you don't get obviously you don't get the ending um so like the campfires that uh started mm-hmm. at the beginning of the world yeah you so know which like, like, the, like the point of the poem is it's <laughs> at least really just me, a culmination that. of um you know a master 
at the height of their powers, really, as a writer. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. She was also having fun. You know, yeah. you, you experiments when you have fun. You let yourself be silly and you let yourself um, you let your mind uh, make connections that you wouldn't normally make in your conscious mind, you know? Yeah, um, we're talking about someone who probably had a lot of trouble having fun with poetry, giving, given her uh, early subject matters of their family and, um, you know, religion and all this shit, so... Yeah, this one she's like she let herself kind of. I think it worked. I think it works because of that because she kind of let herself outside of her, um, outside of her perspective a little bit, and that's kind of what the poem's all about. Well, yes, it's about. It's definitely unique because Cheryl is somebody who very much writes about people in her life the majority of the time. And I don't know if she's ever branched out of her family as successfully as she has in this poem. Um, she had a couple other poems actually about a serial rapist and murderer, uh, but she always connected it to herself, you know, and to the fear that she had when she read the stories. This is something totally uh, outside of her experience, at least as far as I know. But still right. it is an anomaly like like, like um she does have anomalies every once in a while um and they're usually her best poems uh when they work i guess there are probably some that don't work but um uh the other one is that my father speaks for sure is a is a big ano- anomaly even though it is about her father just the way it's told is a uh, you know it's like a one time <laughs> deal you know like she's not going to write a whole series well, of poems well, from his perspective as a ghost uh, right, and that's that's I think of the mistake a lot of writers are making because they feel like every book has to be a project, or at least this was a thing a few years ago. I don't know how I don't, I'm kind of a recluse. I don't know what the fuck is going on right now, but a lot of people were like, "Oh, every book has to be a, you know, like the the Rita Dove book about like the 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 violinist or whatever." Like I, you know, she could have just wrote one really great poem. Um, but for whatever reason, she was like trapped by that subject matter and decided yeah, to write was, a whole book about it. And the father, with, uh, with this black violinist, um, yeah. But. And the father, the book itself could have been a whole bunch of persona poems from the perspective of her dad, but she just saves the best for last in that one, and that's the last poem in the book. And the rest are just revolve around the subject matter. Um, but are firmly in her own perspective. Um, so there is a difference. It's like there's a difference between taking like a trick and trying to extend it for as long for as much juice as you can get. And like then, you know, just honoring the thing you're obsessed with and writing a bunch about it um, because you can get a lot of different weird poems in their own right, even if they are about the same thing or about different aspects of the same thing, which is, I think, what happens in The Father. Even though there are some, I mean, any book of poetry, they're 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 definitely drags. But uh, well, you but, go through uh, stages in life, right? I mean, you had a stage where you're writing nothing but letters. You had this other stage where you were writing nothing but these really long poems. You had this other stage where uh, you were in the MFA and you were trying to write the prototypical MFA poem. Um, <laughs> you had this. Uh, Leo kind of has it too. She had a stage where she's writing nothing but about her patients. Um, and she had this other stage where she's writing nothing but about sex and nothing but about her kid. Uh, so you go through mm-hmm. stages in life. Um, and if the stage makes up a, an entire book of poems with one theme, then you're in luck. You know, yeah, you get lucky. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, or unlucky. Or you didn't. <laughs> yeah, if if the poem, if the stage in your life was, you know, about writing poems about this one subject and nobody likes that subject or re- likes what you had to say about it, uh, right? Or you just tortured, you know, by uh, a thing that nobody likes and it like sucks to you know even think about. <laughs> no, I don't know. Yeah. Um, Rocco was really mm-hmm. obsessed for a long time with. The concept of editing a piece to death, editing it and making it perfect. 
and oh yeah, Tell also me. obsessed with this other this other stage of his life where you know write something new every week every and then every week you got to workshop it, write it, workshop it, write it, workshop it. You know, so you go through there's all kinds of different stages, not just the content of what you're creating or the subject matter, but the process by which it gets ready to be seen by the world. Um, and, and I think, uh, for Sharon Olds, yeah, she occasionally has anomalies. Sometimes, um, as in the case of Stag's Leap, you know, uh, you can't help but write about this thing. You're going through a lengthy divorce that someone you've been married to for, what, like 30 years? She was married to yeah. that guy. Um, you know, naturally, you're going to write about it. And unfortunately, the only thing she could publish at that time was her odes, which I was not a big fan of that book. And I wasn't a giant fan of Stag's Leap, although Stag's Leap was way better. Um, but then, you know, you work your way back up to what you're really meant to be doing, which is Arias. Arias was fucking amazing. Oh, yeah. Arias was like groundbreaking. So, you know, you have stages in your life where you produce a lot, you produce a lot of good stuff, you have other stages. So, I don't know, there's, there's, you can categorize the, the human experience into these little brackets if you wanted, but and it's kind of what a poem is, isn't it? It's like a little bracket of human experience, you know, that's mm-hmm. um, filtered through this poetic lens. But however, however this thing came about, it doesn't, like, ultimately it doesn't matter, it just works. And one of the reasons, you know, not to get back to uh, Summer Solstice, one of the reasons it works, the main reason, I think, is misdirection. You're thinking that something terrible is going to happen to this guy. And it seems like everybody in the story is preparing for something terrible to happen to this guy. And it seems like as they get closer and closer to each other that the tension is building and the tension is building. Guy yeah. grabs him, pulls him off the ledge, shoves him up against a wall. But rather than something terrible happening, he does something miraculous. And it's something small, but it's miraculous nonetheless. He lights a cigarette for him. And the cops the cop does in yeah. his own mouth. Cop's own mouth and hands it to the guy. And they all light cigarettes. And you start to understand it's a story about love, you know. Yes. Um, and what you're describing is um the turn. Um, right. Which is, without it, it's just a bunch of action with no, you know, nothing, no climax, you know, and that moves well, into the, the climax. The climax would have been this guy falling to his death. Um, or right. a lesser story would have been uh, the cop beating him, you know, the cop, um, or shoving him down. But Sheridan is captivated by the humanity in all these people. Um, and she starts to understand that, uh, you know, and we could talk about how background influences home, you know, Sharon Olds, the main abuser in her life. We've talked about it already. was her father. And so you start to think growing up in a household like that, that all men can do to each other and to women is hurt them. But right. she realizes yeah. by the end the epiphany, which is, which happens in the head of <laughs> of the speaker as as she delivers it to uh the reader, is none of this would exist if men didn't learn how to cooperate. If men didn't learn to love and trust one another. Mm. You know? I didn't even think about um, it like in terms of how she views like men, <laughs> which which is a really good point given all the poems she's written about her her dad and the way no, this poem, a... what all that's implied in this poem yeah. up until that turn uh, about what she kind of expects to happen, uh, but doesn't. Nobody will ever convince me that this poem is anything other than a poem about men. <laughs> men are the only characters in the story, <laughs> you know. Um, None of them have names. This isn't a story about John or Jacob or Jeremy or David. This is a story about these men at this place. You know, um, and that's their own, like, literally, that's the cop and the man. (laughs) 
and then this cop and that cop and this man, you know. Um, yeah. So it's a story about men and a woman learning that they can um, uh, be caught. I mean, that, there is <laughs> definitely uh, something to be said about that perspective because, like, we, well, we know Sharon Olds is a woman. I mean, the the <laughs> and the um, but the imagery or the uh, similes she chooses, you know, like the she uh, to receive a birth, a mother whose child has been lost will scream yep. at him. She's kind of using the similes to break out of the action or of the narrative of the scene. Um, and so, yeah, it's a kind of an interesting yeah, way to that's read a great it. Point. See, you can talk about that if you ever teach this poem, the the feminine imagery in this poem about men um this gold he call she calls it a black shell to protect his life um mm. began to lurk towards the man who wanted to die lurk being a you know a kind of action with some negative connotations behind it the tallest mm-hmm. cop approached him directly, softly, slowly talking to him, talking, talking. Even that could be way. like uh, seen as maybe uh, coercive, you know, like yep. it's in its context at this point in the poem, anyway. The man's leg hung. Uh, Sorry, while the man's leg hung over the lip of the next world, and the crowd gathered in the streets silent, a hairy net with its implacable grid was unfolded near the curb and spread out and stretched as the sheet is prepared to receive a birth. Wondrous, beautiful um, imagery. Very feminine in nature. Uh... They all came a little closer, where he squatted next to his death. That's what I mean when I say you feel like there's this dread the whole mm, time. Definitely. Think something terrible is going to happen. His shirt glowing its milky glow like something growing in a dish at night in the dark in a lab. Everything stopped. The height of the poem was the climax. As his body jerked. And pa- pause for a now second. You're, you're ready right now for his body to fall, but it, because she right. ends it with that line, his body jerked. And look he at, look at the um, not to get you too off track, but look at the syntax of those three lines, um, especially growing uh, his shirt gl- glowing in its milky glow like something growing in a dish at night in the dark in a lab, and then like that line right before everything stopped is very fast, and so she's like using her like using syntax basically to to reflect the scene. Um, and back to your point, um, that is the, 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 where everything stops and anything could happen. Um, and, and you're right. Everything up until then is like kind of dark and dreadful. Stepped down from the parapet, and went towards them and they closed on him. I thought they were going to beat him up as a mother whose child has been lost will scream at the child when it's found. They took him by the arms and held him up and leaned him against the wall of a chimney. And the tall cop lit a cigarette in his own mouth and gave it to him. And then they all lit cigarettes. And the red glowing ends burned like tiny campfires we lit at night back in the beginning of the world. That's just masterful, like, almost Rita Dove-esque uh, of taking a an image and spreading it to something totally unexpected mm-hmm. um, but really gets at the heart of the matter of um, of what you're, of what she's trying of, of the wonder she's experiencing you know because like I said as she's building that dread it's a dread like it to me it feels like the dread of somebody you know watching something that they can't look away from and being really terrified that something's going to happen and then yeah then something miraculous happens and not only do they save this man but they comfort him the speaker expects the wonder <laughs> yeah the wonder oh. she was surprised by the wonder and it say like all right i don't want to say that but uh so this is a speaker uh or just a poet sharon old who's 
had a shit, like, went through a lot of shit. And so it it shows her perspective, like, her expectations of the world. Um, and how it's, you know, it's not always as bad as you think it's going to be, you know? And, it, and it's not in a cheesy way, either. Like, the way I say it, when I say it out loud, it sounds, like, kind of cheesy, but... This, it, it's just shown in the poem. And we all know what this is like. Like, we've all been surprised, uh, I think, like, in ways that, um, you know, when you expect the worst, something not as bad or something beautiful happens. Um, and it's a good reminder, you know, that <laughs> just because something is gonna can go wrong, it won't necessarily go wrong, uh, contrary to Newton's law, or uh, uh, Murphy's law, rather. <laughs> um yeah, so there's something what, something miraculous can can happen right on the precipice of something terrible happening. A disaster, and yeah. And it's kind of what we all really uh you know, in our hearts hope for. And it doesn't always happen, of course. But um I think that's why the poem is like it does it feels it's a feel good poem, Craig. <laughs> yeah. I mean and it's it's a it's a rarity in that sense too. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. How many poems have that kind of like hope uh in them uh not uh it's tough, you know, cuz we usually turn to poetry for heartache um and catharsis. Well, under, understand like, heartache and uh to to be relieved from heartache by knowing that other people have gone through similar things, but it's a it's a conundrum, isn't it? To think about what's a time in my life in which something wondrous has happened. You know, I thought something terrible was going to happen, and instead, uh, we get you know something wonderful happen. Um, Adding to the power of the poem, it's not. It is not exactly. Uh, we, we're t- using words like magical or wondrous, and um, but it's still like just grounded in a very uh, in, a, in reality, you know, uh, in a way that you know. Right. I mean, they didn't all start making you know. out, jacking each other off. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they didn't like. You didn't hear party animals or music start playing or everybody starts dancing. I mean, it's. <laughs> well, it's I mean, so like, I, I kind of mean, like, it's a, it's like an everyday, not every day, but it's like a thing that can happen at any time, any, almost anywhere, you know, and in New York, obviously makes it a little bit more extreme because the buildings are so damn tall, but, um, anybody could. It's a sad miracle to too, because this guy's life is still going to be what it was. Whatever, right. whatever, whatever, um, sent him up to the top of that building still exists in his life. But it's a so it's a small miracle, you know. Um, but right, it's and a it's not implied. Life, you it's, know? it's there's nothing to imply that you know that whatever made him change his mind. I guess you know the fact that people seem to give a fuck in one for one moment. Um, that's not enough to build a life on either. You're right about that. And it's the world is still the world, you know. Right, and that's. The other thing that artists have to come to terms with as they're writing or drawing or whatever, making music, is that the world is still the world, and you still have to deal with it on its terms. Um, and Sharon Olds is great because she never forgets that. You know, at any point, at least in, in any of her best work, um, it's a celebration of the world as the world actually is, but it's never forgetting that the world is also this really terrible place <laughs> in a lot of respects. Yeah. You know, as Louis C.K. says, the best thing you can hope for is that you get old and die. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> the person you love, uh, you know, that you die before them, because otherwise you're just alone. <laughs> <laughs> um, All right, stop talking, you Greg. You're, you're bumming me out, man. <laughs> oh, sorry. I, the way Louis C.K. says it is way funnier. <laughs> I know, I know. By the way, it gets to the point of you know that uh, Andre Du Bois story we were talking about the other day. By the way, this is the antithesis of that. This yeah, is a bunch of people God. doing something noble, surely for its own nobility. 
not to cover up anything horrible going on. Uh, yeah. No, as a con- nothing horrible as a consequence happens because of their nobility. Whereas that was, you know, okay, here's this miraculous thing that I did for my kid, but it just shielded evil, shielded her evil in my arms. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but, you know, so both things exist. And both places are the world. The world is the place where, you know, where that story happened and where this story happened. And we as, you know, and we have, we all have to live on, on it. Um, you know, mm-hmm. by the way, yeah, that's a good way it's, to it's a little, summarize it. I <laughs> know it's a little side note. Uh, you've read, um, talk about the antithesis of this. You of course have read, uh, Joyce Carol Oates. Uh, where have you gone? Where have you been? Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. I used to teach um, that one. Great story. Uh, we were having this discussion in my um, in this class that I was taking with a bunch of other teachers uh, about how to grade a student's paper when the student was writing that the point of that story was that um, the girl, I forget her name, Carol, I think. Connie. Uh, right. Connie, Connie. That's Connie met Arnold friend and everything that happened to her happened because she was promiscuous. Oh. Um, and she was a slut basically. And this guy, uh, was karma <laughs> coming oh. to, uh, coming to face her. It was a, it was a dumb read. First of all, because... I've had that argument in class before. Really? I didn't really have to even say anything. I think all the women in the class were like, fuck that shit. <laughs> or at least a couple well, people were just like, fuck true. that shit. Yeah, that's just, like it the, is the just dumb. Of, it could be true. Like, if she wrote story, it like that, it's not like it's not possible, but like, I don't think so, man. She didn't write it like that, though. The Obviously, point of yeah, that yeah, story yeah. Is, is that our old friend, when he shows up at your house, there's nothing you can do. It doesn't matter whether she was a slut or not. She's dead. And that's all that there is to it, you know? And the surprise of that story is that she does do something noble for her family um, to leave with him and to, to, to sacrifice herself for the sake of her family. Um, that's the nobility that happens in this 14-year-old girl. She comes to that catharsis. That uh, she has it in her to give her life up, um, which, by the way, is a kind of also a kind of miracle. You know, um, is it a heartwarming story? No, mm. but uh, pure but horror. I, I feel like yes, it's, it's pure horror. Um, Disguised as <laughs> uh, you know. I think that fiction, uh, literary fiction. I think that Sharon Old had that view of men. You know, had that Joyce Carol Oates view of men. Um, and that this thing happened in her life. Either she saw it or read about it or imagined it or whatever. We don't know um, the background of it. It doesn't really matter how the poem came about. All that we know is um, that it works. But she saw men doing something miraculous, doing something totally noble for the sheer nobility of doing it. And everything turned out great. And that's why, uh, that's probably why this story and this poem meant so much to you, you know, um, early on. It's because it's like, God damn, somebody can write about something truly miraculous happening, use ordinary speech to deliver it to me mm-hmm. with very subtle, you know, um, poetic flourishes that aren't so jarring that they take you out of the poem. In fact, they immerse you even deeper in it. Um, by the way, every line of the poem is an image. Um, almost every line delivers an action or a reflection on an action or a reflection yeah. on an image. Um, so that everything's something's always happening. So much happens mm-hmm. in a poem that only like 
what, 20 lines long, if that. If ever you're writing a poem and you're like, man, this shit just isn't working, just think about like what is actually happening in the poem, like action wise. And it's, you know, this isn't, this isn't a blanket like fix all, but most of the time for me, and I'm not writing about anything happening, <laughs> you know? I'm just sitting on the fucking couch looking out the window drinking a coffee or, you know, whatever the fuck. Um, I've written so many flat poems because you're just in your own head. And this poem is the ultimate get out of your head to like reflect on yourself kind of poem. Um, even though yeah, well, there's no literal reflection, we all we came to a lot of conclusions uh, because we know Sharon Olds a little bit as a writer. Um, but yeah, this is like the ultimate get out of your your head, show some shit happening kind of poem that I think people should write more often, um, even if it's not like kind of your your uh, main uh, mode of writing. It might not be your prototypic typical poem like it kind of like i want it to be for me um but it it's definitely something to learn from like now i coming back to this i knew it, it reminds me to take that with me you know into the next poem maybe yeah right about this time something unexpected happened and um i'm i'm talking like plainly like have things happen in your goddamn poem people yeah <laughs> like real human uh, things moments of human significance that's what we used to talk about you know people falling in and out of love uh, people hurting each other people being ex- exceedingly kind to each other um just the drama of life you know so much so much happens in this world and by the way you can write about things that don't even happen to you you know, write about things that you're just really interested in. Just imagine them happening. Right. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Anyways, buddy, bullet in the brain next time. Yeah, let's just do that. It's, that'll be a um, since we're you know, I dragged my feet on this. I, I'm glad we could meet though uh, today instead of uh, Sunday because I've been having a rough week, um, and I was very distracted being out of town last week anyway so um yeah it was cool this, well, this is good this like is a good poem story, we, poem story poem i can find if i you know i'll probably find a poem i want to talk about uh yeah one of these days and i'll send it to you um we'll figure it but it's great it's great this is actually a really long discussion too i think we uh yeah, we talked for over an hour about a fucking oh, yeah. single poem. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a little bit more than just the poem. I mean, we definitely went on some tangents here and there. But I, uh, you know, yeah, but it's cool. This is like that. a this is like a a holiday poem. You know, summer solstice. It is the summer solstice, by the way, Craig. Um, is it? Yeah, yeah. Today is the longest day of the year. Look at that! Isn't that crazy? Right. Um. So just like our conversation today is long and we must, we must, <laughs> we must part now. Um, but, um, Laura's looking at me like you fucking idiot. Stop talking. <laughs> um, no, that's all, all right. in my head, but, uh, yeah, we need to, um, let's do, let's Boom. just do, bullet, let's just do bullet in the brain. And then maybe since I, th- that'll be kind of like two picks for me. You could pick something. We'll do a story maybe. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah, or whatever. I'll, I'll the, whatever you more want. Uplifting. I'll do. I'll find something more uplifting than a a father story, right? And yeah. Let's just not even mention the name of that story uh, for a <laughs> while, and I'll be happy. <laughs> All right, buddy. Uh, All right. Well, next, hey, next time I send you stuff, you'll read it. All right. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I don't. I don't trust All you, right. man. <laughs> this is a problem. All right. Uh, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, I'll talk to you later. All right, man. Let's talk to you later. Take care. Peace.